Your Eminence, Cardinal Parolin, thank you very much indeed. Your Eminences, Excellencies, Reverend Fathers, distinguished audience. We would like to express our wholehearted gratitude and appreciation to the President of the Centesimus Annus Pro Pontifice Foundation for extending to us a kind invitation on the occasion of your conference, New Policies and Lifestyles in the Digital Age. It is truly a pleasure to address this distinguished audience gathered here today. Please also accept our warm wishes and congratulations for the 25th anniversary of your venerable institution's foundations. Complimenti ed auguri. The opportunity to meet in person with other fellow Christians brings us great joy. We are servants of the Lord who saved us from the bonds of death and opened the gates of paradise for the human race. We all strive to preserve the sacred inheritance of Christianity, to give to the end of the earth the good witness of common salvation, that there is no salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We commend your impressive display of determination to promote the Catholic Church's social doctrine, as was expressed in the Lenten encyclical Centesimus Annus of the late Pope John Paul II. For what is indeed truly Christian is essentially social. Faith is not limited only to the soul without any interest for the social dimension, but rather it also plays a pivotal role at the level of society. Our churches preserve high spiritual values and rich philanthropic traditions. The Church of Rome has a systematic social teaching uh, which contains solutions to difficult issues in the spirit of the principles of the respect of the person, solidarity, subsidiarity, and the common good. On the grounds of these principles, various models were developed and continue to be developed in order to face social challenges and protect human dignity. Today we are facing a serious crisis and its social outcomes on a global scale. We regard this worldwide crisis as a crisis of solidarity an ongoing process of desolidarization, which puts the very future of humanity at risk. It is our deep conviction that the future of humanity is related to the resistance against this crisis and the establishment of a culture of solidarity. So, how then does this crisis of solidarity come to be? And what are its parameters and the areas of society within which it appears? To answer these questions, we now refer to three fields where this occurs. First, the field of economy and ecology. In recent years, we have experienced an immense economic crisis that is connected to the process of globalization and its ensuing implications, the surrender of culture to economy, the increase of poverty, famine and scarcity, and the tragedy of mass migration. We evaluate the so-called fundamentalism of the market, 
the deification of profit, the association of dignity with property, the reduction of the human being to homo economicus, and the subordination of the human person to the tyranny of needs as extremely serious contemporary threats to a culture of solidarity. Society is being transformed into a gigantic market. Social achievements are shrinking and the gap between rich and poor is widening. The right of the economically powerful and the pursuit of the greatest possible profit are considered to be the only way to achieving economic growth. It appears that the human race, with its expanded and insightable needs, is inclined to eradicate humanity's spiritual heritage. Even children are being systematically converted through the educational system into consumerists. As was rightly said, childhood itself has basically become an economic category. In the end, we are convinced that the exclusive orientation of economic activity towards the maximization of profit does not function either for sustainable economic development or for the common good. It essentially breaks up humanity into privileged and underprivileged, and it becomes an expression of a lack of solidarity, which lack is naturally not able to form a steady foundation for the future. Next, the ecological problem is an issue that is closely related to economic development, which is something that is constantly growing. Extreme economism causes both serious economic and ecological problems. An economy that is autonomized from a human being's real needs unavoidably leads to the exploitation of nature and the destruction of the natural environment. We single-handedly destroy the conditions of humanity's survival and coexistence in the name of short-term profit and benefit. It is self-evident that the consequences of the ecological problem, which first and foremost affect those individuals who are socially and economically weak, constitute a serious threat for social cohesion and increase desolidarization. Second, the field of science and technology. The rapid progression of science and technology, together with its beneficial consequences, also leads to outcomes that do not promote a culture of solidarity. Technology is no longer man's servant, but instead is his primary driving force, which requires complete obedience, as well as imposes its own principles on all aspects of life. The almighty electronic means of communication do not simply disperse information, but also broadcast values, their own values. They reshape our views regarding the meaning of life. They direct our needs, thereby creating artificial needs, and they lead the way to a future that is dominated by them. The charm of technological achievements leads to the identification of progress with technological progress. We worship technology and its highest symbol, the computer, as our God, while simultaneously expecting to receive 
all our benefits, joy, communication, progress, information, jobs, etc., from it. The Homo Faber becomes Homo Fabricatus. In fact, we face a plethora of problems, many problems that are not of technological nature and cannot be solved through the accumulation of more information. Social injustice, divorces, violence, crimes, loneliness, fanaticism, and the clash of civilizations are not caused by a lack of information and technology. We see that some of these issues are actually growing hand in hand with the technological progress of society. Never before have we possessed so much scientific knowledge and acted so violently and destructively against nature and our fellow human beings. We even continue to produce terrible weapons of mass destruction and risk the possibility of a nuclear world war. In the West, the explosion of knowledge and information fostered disinterest towards other people, as well as a spirit of individualism and deification of property. Whereas in other regions of the world, technology easily coexists with social injustice and religious fundamentalism. The Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church that convened on the island of Crete in June 2016 stated that scientific knowledge does not motivate man's moral will. Similarly, your church, the Catholic Church, in the final document produced by the pre-synodal meeting that took place in Rome here last March, entitled Young People, the Faith and Vocational Discernment, expressed the following remarkable view. While technology has for some augmented our relationships, for many others it has taken the form of an addiction becoming a replacement for human relationship and even God. Paradoxically, in some countries, technology and particularly internet is accessible while the most basic needs and services are still lacking. Another fact is that scientific and technological progress do not provide answers to the deepest existential problems of the human being, nor do they eliminate them. Hence, science, the great power, is not almighty after all. The dominance of machines, the deterioration of human relations, and the chaos of information do not benefit solidarity and the interest for common good. Rather, they individualize the human person and imprison him to a virtual reality. Semia iconiki pragmatikotita. The autonomization of science and technology from man's vital needs his various dependencies, which he creates in conjunction with economism, scientism, and extreme experiments with human nature, constitute a great danger to a society of solidarity. And the third point, the field of society and politics. One of the more dangerous contemporary tendencies for a culture of solidarity is individualism, self-idolization, and self-entrapment to egotistic self-sufficiency, which creates chasms between people. 
the dominating words of today are me, io, myself, mine, mio, autonomy, self-realization, and self-admiration. Individualism is accompanied by eudaimonism, whose aim in life is the satisfaction of as many needs as possible, as well as the creation and securing of new needs. As has been clearly stated, the zone logon echon, Aristoteles, today has become zon echon, without logos. Homo habens, who is fed by the possession of material goods, as well as by the possession of his own individuality, a bearer and expresser of not only the foolish rich man's greed and avarice, but also of the Pharisee's autosoteric vanity. It is only natural then that this possessive relationship with, the, with all people and all things, as well as with our own self, does not leave any space for love and solidarity, for sharing and communion. Today, human rights, which form the core of contemporary political culture, are yet another topic that is connected to the problem of solidarity. The West has always given emphasis to individual rights and that has, and that has unfortunately led to their identification with individualism. On the other hand, non-Western civilizations invoking the West's understanding of human rights reject individual rights and base upon this their entire negative stance against the culture of modernity. Certainly, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which celebrates its 70th anniversary this year, characterized itself as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations. This way, human rights are considered to be a universal humanistic criterion which is able to function as the yarn of Ariadne inside the labyrinth of contemporary pluralism. Today, though, this function of human rights is disputed by the postmodern understanding of pluralism in the sense of the unfolding devaluation and re-evaluation of traditional values, the warning or not existent consensus in terms of common standards, the complete rejection of any general criterion, the fetishism of indifference, extreme subjectivism, and the dominance of parallel monologues instead of a real dialogue. When confronted with these contemporary givens and tendencies, what should the required stance for us Christians be? Two things are certain. First, that we cannot ignore this immense crisis of solidarity because economic and social problems affect human beings at the very core of their existence and dignity. And second, that nobody can face these problems alone. We need each other. We need a common agenda, common mobilization, common efforts, and common goals. It is our deep conviction that in this effort, the contribution of our churches remains crucial. They have preserved high values, precious spiritual and moral heritage, and deep anthropological 
knowledge. Over the last decades, we have witnessed a re-evaluation of the role of religion for human existence. It is not by chance that in our present day, the talk about the coming post-religious age has been replaced by the discourse of a post-secular period in which religions claim and play a public role and join all the remarkable efforts of humankind. As Pope Emeritus Benedict writes, we had the privilege to visit His Holiness yesterday in the afternoon and to have really enjoyed his wisdom once again. Pope Benedict writes, complete secu secularity, profanité, which was developed in the West is something deeply foreign for other civilizations of the world. They are convinced that a world without God does not have any future. For His Eminence, Walter Cardinal Casper, it is a commonly accepted truth that every society needs institutions of transcendence, which publicly represent the dimension of the divine. The modern attempt to found society on atheistic or religiously indifferent principles has failed. Thank you, Your Eminence. Please, please allow me, allow me to repeat it. The modern attempt to found society on atheistic or religiously indifferent principles has failed. It is certain, though, that the repulsion of transcendence extinguishes the creative powers of men, paralyzes hope, and feeds cynicism. On the contrary, our faith strengthens our commitment of human action, and it widens our witness for freedom, justice, and peace. A human being is not only a citizen of the world, but also a citizen of heaven. In Greek, we say uranopolitis, a creature longing for eternal life. The Orthodox tradition regards the human being as zon theumenon, a living being to be deified, which provides human beings with the utmost dignity, underscoring true humanization and the fullness of its God-given freedom in the body of Christ, the Church, which is called by the fathers of the Church Kinonia Theosios, that is, communion of deification. Saint Athanasius, the great patriarch of Alexandria, says, God became man so that we might become God. There is nothing as sacred as a human being whose nature God himself has shared, according to Saint Nicholas Cabasilas. Indifference for men is indifference towards God and His commandments. God is present wherever love, fraternity, and solidarity exist. The famous biblical parable of the Good Samaritan describes the spontaneous compassion and support for the suffering person, despite the fact that this person was a foreigner or even an enemy. Another impressive truth in this parable is expressed in the answer of Jesus to the initial question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? For Jesus, the truth of love 
is to become a neighbor for everybody who needs support. His Holiness Pope Francis eloquently refers to the truth of limitless love towards our neighbor in his conversation with Andrea Tornielli on the occasion of the Year of Divine Mercy, stating that we have received without having done anything to deserve it. And as a consequence, we offer without asking for something in return. We are called to serve Christ, who died on the cross, in the face of every marginalized person. We recognize the Lord in every human being who is abandoned, hungry, and thirsty, who is naked and in prison, sick or unemployed, in persecution or in flight. That is where we meet our God, where we directly touch the Lord. This morning, myself and my colleagues had the privilege to be received once again by His Holiness Pope Francis, who gave us a medal. I think it is the medal of his fifth year of pontificate. And we read on this medal, Hospes Eram et Collegistis Me. Christ himself told us this when he announced to us on which grounds we are to be judged. In as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. In this spirit, we regard the present multifaceted crisis as an opportunity for practicing solidarity, for dialogue and common action, for communication and cooperation, for openness and confidence, and for continuing the long and impressive Christian tradition of philanthropy. Today, our churches are called to function as a positive challenge to individuals and peoples, offering an alternative model of life within the contemporary culture that bestowed humanity with precious gifts, but at the same time seems to push people to live for themselves, ignoring the others with whom they are sharing the same world. Our churches resist injustice and all antipersonal powers that undermine social cohesion by putting forth the social content of the Christian gospel. They exercise critique on the declaration of the rise of economic indicators to the absolute criterion of economic activity and the subordination of the human being to consumerism. In this spirit, the Ecumenical Patriarchate declared the year 2013 as a year of universal solidarity. In our patriarchal encyclical, we articulated the conviction that the ongoing worldwide economic and social crisis expresses a lack of solidarity. Solidarity with the human being and solidarity with creation are the presuppositions not only of peaceful coexistence, but even the sheer survival of humanity. We consider the approach of the ecological crisis in connection with social problems to be especially important. It is Pope Francis and our common belief that the current economic developments within the framework of globalization destroy social cohesion, solidarity, and the overall function of interpersonal relations. It is precisely this spirit that the encyclical Laudato Si and our common message with Pope Francis 
on the World Day of Prayer for Creation, which His Eminence already mentioned, express. This is what our texts express. From the very beginning, we have supported the idea that serving our fellow human beings, preserving nature, environmental justice and social justice are inextricably interconnected. It is quite characteristic that the Roman Catholic Church started by addressing social matters and continues its way to the Laudato Si encyclical in 2015, which has the ecological issue as its core. While, on the contrary, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which in 1989 began concerning itself with the care for the natural environment, today finds itself also engaged in a struggle for a culture of solidarity, first ecology and now culture of solidarity, for the protection of the sacredness of childhood, for the support of refugees, as well as uh, in initiatives against modern slavery. We have uh, convoked a meeting in Istanbul in the Fanar together with His Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury on slavery in February 2017. And only a few weeks ago, we repeated such a meeting, such a conference on slavery in Buenos Aires under the auspices, again, of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Therefore, it was natural and beneficial for us to meet in our journey, Catholics and Orthodox. It is impossible for our churches to maintain a stance of indifference when confronted with scientism, which converts the human being into a measurable object. Churches stress that the human person encapsulates dimensions that are unattainable to science. Our churches therefore express their concern against this autonomization of science and technology from the vital needs of the human being against the dependencies that are created and the dangers that follow. <clears throat> we worry for our endangered freedom, for our precious traditions that are being lost, and for the natural environment that is being destroyed. <clears throat> we are concerned about the fact that, as Pope Emeritus Benedict some days before his election stated, the moral power of the human being <coughs> has not increased in parallel with the progress of science, but rather it has been reduced. This disparity between technical capacities and our moral faculty is the greatest threat at this moment in history. Ligo Nero. Excuse me. We are also aware that whatever is scientifically and technologically feasible does not necessarily mean that it is also essential and good. It is self-evident that the criticism against the deification of technology does not necessarily mean the devaluation of the beneficial works of scientific and technological progress. Science and technology have a human dimension and contribute to the solution of humanity's problems today. Nevertheless, 
nothing amplifies the arrogance of contemporary men as much as faith in almighty science and technology. The future, though, does not seem to belong to the self-ordained man-god, anthropotheos in Greek, who, as a new Prometheus, ignores or even abolishes limits and measures, as well as destroys the conditions of life on the earth. We remind the admirers of scientism and technopoly that real progress does not exist when the human person and his freedom are being undermined. Referring to the mentioned third field on society and politics, we underline that from our church's point of view, the future does not belong to the individual who concerns himself with his own self, but to the overcoming of this self-centeredness. Real freedom is the exit from our own self. As has been properly stated, the door to freedom only opens towards the outside. The Church as a communion of relations, as the foremost space of the culture of personhood, constitutes a great challenge for the contemporary individual-centric civilization and for the autosoteric narcissism of contemporary men and women. Church's ascetical ethos is offered as an alternative proposal of life to the homo habens, who identifies his own eudaimonia with having and the multiplication of his own satisfied needs. It is imperative and crucial to promote and develop in action the social workforce of our Christian faith, the loving relation with our fellow human beings. Our common Christian agenda also encompasses dialogue with human rights. We are obliged to separate the humanistic essence and impetus of human rights from the individualistic understanding of the right. The generally negative stances of some churches against human rights are not based predominantly on theological criteria, but on historical circumstances and mutual prejudices. In the dialogue on human rights, our churches have the ability to promote their humanitarian and philanthropic views, as well as to point out that the claim of rights does not constitute the highest ethos, which for them is the free renouncement from our own individual rights in the name of love, the agape, that does not seek its own. Eopia agape uzitita eaftis. The Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church 2016 emphasized that the Orthodox ideal in respect of man transcends the horizon of established human rights, and that greatest of all is love. Indeed, the history of freedom does not begin with the history of modern human rights. The history of freedom does not begin with the history of modern human rights. Dear distinguished participants, dear friends, in the title of our address, A Common Christian Agenda for the Common Good, we come across the word common twice. The Church is, in fact, the place of the common, common salvation, common freedom, common good, common ethos, and common obedience. Life in the Church is a foretaste and an expectation of the common resurrection and the common kingdom. 
we are not a sum of individuals, but a community of persons, a community of love. In the church, the kainon, the new, is the koinon, the common. In the communion of the church, mind and heart, faith and knowledge, freedom and love, the individual and society, the human being and the entirety of creation are all reconciled. It is for this very reason that the church resists the powers of division, individualism and totalitarianism, oppression and exploitation, economism and consumerism, scientism and the deification of technology, as well as the destruction of the natural environment and anthropomonism, the response to the divisions and the impasses of human freedom is the incarnate logos of God. Our faith is an inexhaustible source of crucial truths for human beings and the world, for our relation to God, to ourselves, to others, and to creation, for our freedom, for the meaning of life, and the final destination of all. The Church offers help and truth. It orients the human being towards eternity and does not allow for him to be reduced to a sheer living being, nor to become an ubermensch. For Pope Francis and us, the identity and value of a culture or a society cannot be judged by the level of its economic growth, its technological development, or its social organization. In fact, while these are important elements, they are not the essence of a civilization. A civilization is judged by whether or not its final point of reference is the human person in relation to his true divine destiny and the protection of his world. We reject the cynical phrase, there is no alternative. In other words, we reject the claim that nonconformity to the commandments of globalization and to the autonomy of the economy leads inevitably to the expansion of poverty and to uncontrollable societal developments and conflicts. It is unacceptable for the alternative forms of development and the strength of social solidarity and justice to be ignored and slandered. Our churches can create new possibilities of transformation for our world. In fact, the church itself is an event of transformation, of sharing, of love, and of openness. It is utopic to believe that solidarity and social cohesion can be achieved through globalization and the raising of living standards or through the internet and communication. In our churches, we experience the blessed certainty that the future does not belong to having but to being not to pleonexia, but to sharing, not to individualism and selfishness, but to communion, nor does it belong to division, but to love. God is love, o theos agapi esti, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We continue our common journey, our theological dialogue, our common struggle, 
and our common Christian witness of love, the preeminent transformative power, as the Lord instructed us. Love and diaconia are service, are the essence of the eleftheria, e Christos imas eleftherose, of freedom, of the freedom in which Christ has set us free. We thank all of you for your kind attention.